you everyone so much for joining us today for this incredible Lunch and Learn with SWOP Behind Bars. Um, we have Alex Andrews and Melanie Dante with us today. I'm so excited for this conversation and thank you all for joining us. Um, my name is Rachel McKinnon. I'm PAVE's Outreach Director. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, and I wanna give you just a little bit of background about PAVE before we jump in. So PAVE is unique in the fact that we work on both the preventative and the educational side and also the healing and empowering survivors to thrive after trauma. Um, we take a positive approach to engage people of all genders to be part of the solution to end gender-based violence. Um, part of the reason that Melanie and Alex are here today, um, they are one of our Survivor Outreach Center partners, which is a new coalition that we started about a year ago. Um, everyone, if you wanna check out survivors.org, um, that is where all of our coalition members are listed um, in our database. We have been building the coalition for you know, the past year and we have confirmed over 800 partners nationwide at this point, um, including everyone who aids in healing um, and supporting survivors and also just you know, lawyers, um, holistic healers um, and nonprofit organizations. So there are a couple of different ways to get involved with PAVE if you wanna get involved. We have three amazing new committees that we're starting. Um, so the Survivor Support Committee, Diversity and Inclusion Committee, and a legislative committee working to change laws um, surrounding survivors and gender-based violence. Um, also, we have PAVE chapters. You can start a high school, college, or community-based chapter. We have social media ambassadors or PAVE ambassadors. And we are also accepting applications for new members on our board of directors. Um, so with that being said, um, you know, thank you again all so much for being here today. And I will turn it over to our lovely presenters to introduce themselves. Hi, thank you. My name is Alex Andrews. I am the executive director of the Sex Worker Outreach Project uh, Behind Bars. We, our primary focus is uh, to provide services and support for people who are incarcerated, are being released from jail or prison, or are at risk of incarceration um, for trading sex or for sex trafficking, which is very often, unfortunately, we have a lot of sex trafficking survivors and victims that are arrested um, during the course of a lot of the human trafficking stings. So that is, um, that is our primary mission is to provide services and support. But we do run a national hotline um, for uh, it's, it's the SWAP community support line. It's been in existence for about seven years now. Um, we have gone from getting about six calls a week to about 150 to 200 calls a week, which is a lot of calls. <laughs> um, uh, it's been some of the best work um, that I've ever been involved with. I enjoy the um, pr provision of the, the community support line and having a safe place where people who identify as sex workers, sex trafficking survivors or victims feel like they can call and be empowered to take control of their own life and and advocate for themselves. I think it's really important that we that we provide people with the tools they need and let them take the paths that they take at their own their own way. I'm here today with Melanie Dante, who is just the most fabulous case manager on the planet. Um, she's been with us for the last four or five years, I think, and and she's just absolutely amazing. I love her in every way, and she's so knowledgeable and incredible helpful. Melanie? Wow. Thank you, Alex. It's going to be hard to, to actually step into that. Wow. Um, so yes, I was introduced to Alex in 2016 by Bella Robinson at Coyote, Rhode Island. We began working together in a volunteer capacity in 2017. And most of the work I did was with communications, educational outreach, um, heavily involved with the memorials for International Trans Remembrance Day and International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers. Uh, I was completely taken by surprise when they brought me on board for uh, training in case support and case management in January. I have been diligently working to step up to the, the tasks at hand which um, are increasing much more so, um, exponentially more so, and with much more complexity than I would have presumed five years ago. Um, I will say that passion at this point now is balancing with reason and we're having to really figure out uh, the coalitions that can help with solutions to problems that are coming up um, daily and in ways that none of us were really expecting. 
especially with the increase in violence that has come up over the last couple of years. It has been very rewarding work, but at the same time also at times heartbreaking. So today is June 2nd. The Lunch and Learn was a wonderful opportunity to be able to introduce one of the calendar days that sex worker rights organizations and sex workers acknowledge. International Sex Workers Day, which is a more polite way of saying what the day was originally defined as, is held on June 2nd to mark the 1975 occupation of a church in Lyon, France. Approximately 100 sex workers who at that point were defined as wives and mothers and community members and not as sex workers were protesting their criminalized and exploitive conditions. There had been a number of women who had disappeared and when their friends and peers were reporting their, their missing, them as missing, the women were fined and threatened and eventually imprisoned they realized is that the law enforcement in that area was complicit with the disappearances of the women who were working within the, uh, the weave of their community. During the day, they were known as wives and as mothers and as working class women, but they were actually working within a syndicate system. And there was great exploitation. So that 1975 occupation was the beginning of the international sex workers rights movement, which is why I thought it would be very fitting to use a slide that I created uh, referencing the global network of sex work projects. NSWP is a global research and think tank that watches over and collects the voices of sex workers sex worker rights organizations and academics seeking to improve the public discourse on topic. Their consensus statement for the day covers eight areas of human rights that they feel are integral. It's the right to associate and organize. A lot of people don't realize that for sex workers to gather at one point and even at this time can be conspiratorial. So for the workers to be able to associate, to even discuss the issues that are at hand, that has been something that people have had to work very hard and fight for. There's the right to be protected by the law. And that is that sex workers are, have not been able to report violent crimes. So it's a very new turn of events where in California recently, uh, finally sex workers are able to report violent crimes along with carry condoms, which were used as instruments of crime if they were to have any kind of public discussion with police. And if they had the condoms on them, it would be the equivalent of a reason to be able to do a full search and seizure and then be arrested. The right to be free from violence is the right to report crimes and the right to have those crimes be something that is punishable by law. In many areas, if a sex worker reports a violent crime, it is not considered to be a priority. They don't have the voice to be able to report those crimes and have them taken seriously. The right to be free from discrimination, to be able to enter into establishments, to have housing, the right to privacy and the freedom from arbitrary interference, such as having condoms taken away and used as instruments of crime or telephones used as instruments of crime. They have the right to health and to health care, the right to move and migrate, and the right to work and have free choice of employment. These areas are under attack in different countries in different ways. And on International Sex Workers Day, it is a time where people from different cultures and communities gather virtually and literally to be able to share the voice of the problems that are happening within their areas. A swap behind bars created a presentation for the international uh, human trafficking and Social Justice Conference in Toledo, Ohio. We updated this presentation to be able to really clarify for today 
what is a growing area. It's called the viminal space. And it is meaning the victim and the criminal. The victim and criminal stuck in the middle is the status which with the changing of many laws, sex workers are finding themselves defined as. And are we able to play the presentation now? Can you see the presentation, Melanie? Right now, the only thing I see is the slide, actually. Um, June 2nd, or do you want, is this one the one that you're looking for? We would be the playing the PowerPoint, which is the Viminal in the Middle. Yep, and so first we'll explain the Sex Workers Outreach Project Behind Bars is an extension of Sex Workers Outreach Project. It's a national grassroots social justice network dedicated to the fundamental human rights of sex workers and their communities. Founded in 2016, SWAT Behind Bars carries the mission to further to engage with currently and formerly incarcerated individuals who have traded sex. SWAT Behind Bars uses a harm reduction framework to offer resources, community building projects, educational programs, and advocacy striving to end violence and stigma. The victim criminal caught in the middle, the viminal. Well, so services and support for the people trying to survive in the sex trade or exit the sex trade, whether that choice is by choice or coercion, it falls short of the expectations and sustainable needs. People are asking for help in ways that we are unexpectedly not able to easily provide. Sometimes that's in the form of toiletries. Sometimes that is in the form of housing, uh, short and long-term resources. It is not until people attempt to reach out for help and we try to find resources that we really understand how much stigma there is. And the issues, access to services, stigma, gender identity, criminal records, substance abuse, trauma, age, race, class, all of these are factors that service providers struggle with in trying to get the resources to the people who are in need of them. And right now, sex workers have diverse needs relating to exit and aid. Some of what I've done here is show some of the voices that are coming in from our actual hotline. And with that, what we see is that COVID has had a major impact on the ability for people to earn money and access resources to feel safe and to be able to take care of their basic needs. We also have an increase in workers who are HIV positive, who are no longer able to discreetly and privately fulfill their needs. We are finding that from basic housing and access to medication, to being able to keep bills on and travel to where they will feel safe, people are looking for resources that definitely do take coalitions and uh, alliances between organizations and regions. So evaluating risk and harm. Right now at the intersection of sex work and sex trafficking, there's the challenge with the criminalization factor, which is why there is a huge push for decrim. Most people will understand decrim defined as the Nordic model, but sex workers actually prefer the New Zealand model. The New Zealand model is something that allows for them to interact with their communities. That said, the differences between sex work and sex trafficking, sex work, is adult and consensual. It's free from force, fraud, and coercion, and equal exchange of labor. Many workers find sex work empowering, where people can freely make choices that impact the outcome. There's a bodily autonomy factor when one is doing work that they feel that they are engaged in and empowered by. Sex trafficking, force, fraud, coercion of an adult or minor 
abuse, trauma, exploitation, uncompensated labor, and a lack of control over one's body and decisions. Swap Behind Bars and most of the affiliated nonprofits use what would be defined as a harm reduction model. Harm reduction is usually defined in terms of substance abuse. We apply it to sex work with a similar philosophy. That according to Harm Reduction International, harm reduction refers to policies, programs, and practices that aim to minimize negative health, social, and legal impacts that are associated with criminalized activities and behaviors. When harm reduction is applied to sex work, it takes on that views trading sex for money and resources are a consensual choice. It focuses on who people are rather than what they do. Meaning each situation is individual and unique to itself. Harm reduction recognizes the myriad of reasons why people engage in the sex trade, seeking to help people meet goals as defined for themselves in non-judgmental and compassionate ways. Harm reduction recognizes the potential for infectious disease and physical safety consequences, meaning that reaching out and being preventive in harm reduction capacity to help to minimize potential injury or harm from STIs, hepatitis, HIV, or from violence. Harm reduction seeks to provide holistic support rather than isolated interventions. And this is where we're all learning to get to know each other better so that we can figure out how to actually be a benefit to those who are in need. Harm reduction highlights that the criminal justice response to sex work has had on the sex trade, for, the highlights that the impact that the criminal justice response to sex work has had on people in the sex trade and seeks to eliminate socio-political barriers to care, safety, and general well-being. This is where behavioral health and social services are coming into play alongside of the criminal justice system in a reformative manner. Harm reduction believes that incorporating a diverse range of sex workers into public health policies and discussions can be a gateway into community health betterment. Those who have been there can contribute their voice and their experiences to say what has worked and what hasn't for them to see what can actually produce better change and eradicate factors that were creating problems. Harm reduction understands that one individual experience does not equal that of all individuals. And though the collective voice creates a large tapestry, that each individual experience is unique. This model is new. It's defined as a public health response initiative as opposed to criminal justice response. So swap behind bars exists to fill the void in services and support. The need is real and has been growing each year since the FOSTA-SESTA legislation. SWAT Behind Bars allies with criminal justice organizations and allied nonprofit entities to navigate individuals through the current complex systems of sex work and sex traffic reform. This has not been an easy task, but one that everybody has worked very hard to step up to, learning how to work with each other in new and improved ways daily. And that is why we are very, very pleased that we were able to participate in today's Lunch and Learn, Rachel. For more information, you can check out the website, which is swapbehindbars.org. You can also contact either Alex or myself directly. So one of the things that um, we wanted to directly um, address, um, and one of several things, but um, violence against women, violence against people who are involved in the sex trade is very, very real. Um, a lot of people don't realize, but um, people who have been 
sexually assaulted and have also been engaged in trading sex are often dismissed by um, police officers or when they when they try to report it. Um, it's not uncommon or it's not been uncommon in the past for people who are sexually assaulted, they may go to a hospital or to a um, to a, a local victim service center. And um, when they report it, they will inform the police and then the police will target them for harassment and um, and intimidation and want to know more and all that sort of thing. We really want to believe that law enforcement um, is making efforts to um, change some of this um, really bad behavior. <laughs> um, but we can't honestly say that um, that, that has ceased. Um, this is one of the reasons why we really like the, um, the New Zealand model. Um, and, and they are even making changes to that to expand it so that it is more encompassing to migrant workers and people who are immigrants um, to New Zealand. But um, in the uh, New, uh, New Zealand decriminalized sex work, I think about 16 years ago. And um, one of our, um, our co-founders um, from Swap Behind Bars spent um, 90 days in, in um, New Zealand talking with sex workers and asking them questions for a study on the impact of criminalization on violence. And what she found was, is when she would ask these sex workers, so are you afraid of the police? They would, they would give her kind of this like weird look and kind of tilt their head and say, why would we be afraid of the police? And that's a complete shift from what we experience in the United States. Um, and that is, you know, that is, that is something that we would really like to see, to see more of is we would like to see fewer people be, be, um, involved in, <laughs> in um, I, I completely lost my train of plot when someone comes in in the middle to try to kiss me hello. Um, uh, that is something that we would really like to expand is, is we would like people to be less afraid of police, but we would also like police to be less, give us less reasons to fear, I guess. <laughs> um, that would be that would be incredibly helpful. Um, yeah. and thing that some I, I've had people be very surprised when I've shared that workers with whom I've spoken are more afraid of the police than of pimps and predators. That that statement seems to completely you know, throw people for a loop. And usually people will say that they are more afraid or more concerned about the police than pimps and predators. We'd like for people to have no concerns except for you know, what they wanna wear that day or you know, what they're going to eat. And that's part of it is to be able to figure out how to interact with the concerns of who is actually the, a problem uh, and, and how we can start to dissolve those problems. Is that accurate, that's it, Alex? That's it exactly. That's it exactly. Um, I know that we have someone that commented um, in the chat about forced fraud and coercion not having to be present in the case of minors. This is very true. Um, anyone under the age of 17 and 364 days is considered a um, a trafficking victim, and they are provided with um, services under in a lot of states, which are safe harbor laws. Um, in the state of Florida, and I'm using that as an example because I live here, the safe harbor law was actually enacted in 2012, but the law itself and the provisions that it made there within it did not include funding until 2017. So when we pass laws that mean that we're not going to arrest juveniles, um, we're, we're not going to um, we're not going to prosecute them, we're not going to put them behind bars. We have to realize that very often when they are out involved in um, trading sex as minors, um, they might be leaving an abusive um, situation. They they might be. Um, in a lot more danger um, than than what we know about, and they may not always be able to talk about that. So that's that's one of the things that we really want to open a dialogue to talking about. How can we have these conversations with young people that will help them better be able to share what they need in order to feel safe? Because right now it's completely up to the state. If, um, the other flip side of that is the minute you turn 18, you go from being a full-on victim to being a full-on criminal. Um, one of the women that we provided services for um, was an 18-year-old. She was arrested two weeks after she, she turned 18 
um, she had a 17 year old that she had disco that discovered at a bus stop. She had brought her into her home. The girl was trading sex. Um, they were there um, together. She was charged with sex trafficking. She did five years in prison, and has been sentenced to 25 years of sex offender probation. Needless to say, it's a very, you know, it's a very difficult story to hear, but, you know, she was a minor herself when she was, um, when she was first got involved in the industry, she had experienced severe forms of abuse and neglect and, um, and substance abuse and just all of the intersecting things that were there. So, um, incarceration just doesn't help. Um, it doesn't help trauma victims and it doesn't help, um, trafficking um, trafficking victims. We really want to center the survivor. We really want to center the person who um, has been harmed. We really want to make sure that we are providing adequate and appropriate services and support um, for people who are treating sex and have also experienced sexual violence. Um, that's incredibly important to us. Um, Melanie, would you like to open the floor for questions? Absolutely. I, I have the chat box pulled up. So we are we are very very receptive to that and what time do we end rachel because right now it's almost 1 30 so we have we definitely have time for discussion definitely so i would say at the latest um two eastern is when we would end um but mm -hmm. whatever feels best to everyone um we can end whenever all right so let's see if there are any questions and we will see how long that takes if yes As a um, as an antidote, I guess um, on I believe it was Friday um, in anticipation of this and in, in anticipation of um, uh, June second, I posted on my personal Twitter account that I have been doing sex work since 1984 and I have never been assaulted by a client. However, I have been assaulted by a cop, a bondsman, and an attorney. So ask me how I feel about Nordic model interventions. And the results of that tweet was my first ever going viral. Um, and it was kind of terrifying, um, but the responses were, were completely varied and often a little bit of off topic. Um, people, did not, um, people did not know what the Nordic model was. They did not know what the Swedish model was. They didn't know the difference between criminalization and legalization and decriminalization and all of these really complicated um, things that go into it. Actually, um, Alex, can we ask the attendees then if they do know what the difference is between the models? Yes, we can. The, there, there are four models of criminalization um, in the world. I'm sure there's probably more and special little um, um, stigma and discrimination that goes along with those. But um, there is criminalization, which is full criminalization. Everybody involved in the trading of sex gets um, arrested. There is um, what they call partial decriminalization or Nordic model information. Yes, we are a support line um, that accepts volunteers. Um, there is a um, the partial criminalization, which is um, often called the Nordic model. It is actually officially the Swedish model, but people don't often recognize that. And it's where the person who is selling services is not arrested, but the person who is buying services is arrested. The idea behind that is, it's sort of a knee jerk reaction to the whole trafficking conversation. Um, people don't, people, it's really important for the criminal justice service system to have a criminal and a victim. And they don't have a lot of room for gray area. And um, unfortunately, there's a lot of gray area <laughs> that um, I think is is within the whole world. But there's there's a lot of gray area that we know about. Um, so partial decriminalization is sort of ridiculous because you are taking an adult consensual transaction and criminalizing half of it. You know, it's like having a peanut butter and jelly with no jelly. Um, and so it's it's very um, it's very confusing. Then we we also have um, legalization and legalization is what you're probably familiar with in Germany, um, in Australia, a few counties in Nevada. And that is where someone gets a license to go to, um, to work in a legal um, brothel or a legalized industry. And um, the problem with that from our perspective is that 
it raises the barrier for people who are trading sex in order to survive. It raises those barriers because they are not able to go down and pay for to be fingerprinted at the sheriff's statements or they're too intimidated by that. Um, being able to have control of your own body is just something that's incredibly, um, incredibly helpful um, when you want to get in and when you want to get out as well. Um, we are not deaf to the fact that we need to spend more time talking with people about exit strategies. Um, and one of our goals for 2022 is to create a comprehensive exit strategy um, that will help people who have been involved in sex work by their own volition or through forced fire coercion, or that was working for them and now it's not, and now they've got to figure out um, what what they need to do. Uh, Melanie has posted some very helpful um, uh, things in the chat. Uh, Bella has always posted the most amazing stuff. The um, four models, um, uh, it's a YouTube video, so that'll make it really easy. Everybody should really like that. Um, someone is asking, I'm gonna have to put my glasses on, I'm sorry. Um, what concrete steps can sex work, can organizations take to advocate for a more sensitive approach to how law enforcement inter interacts with those involved in the commercial sex industry? Especially with dealing with young sex workers who may have started when they were underage but are suddenly criminalized. Oh gosh, yeah, that's just the, that's just the most difficult one. You know, outreach and harm reduction and all of these concrete steps are not concrete. They're squishy. Um, we have to be willing to build relationships that are built on trust and dignity and um, and treating people with respect. Um, these are the thing. These are the strategies that we have to work to be as people, so that we bring them into our organizations and that we bring them back into our community. Um, compassion, um, but not sympathy not feeling empathy. sorry for someone yeah um, understanding how they feel and understanding that they may not be able to make a full turnaround within the next 15 minutes which is you know i mean we can't stay out on outreach forever you know so make sure that you're you've always got condoms make sure you always have cigarettes it gives you an opportunity to build a relationship with people who are involved in street work um with with people who are involved in the community and when someone says you know, that they're a sex worker or that they're a gig worker or they're an econ you know, a, a, um, a stripper or whatever, try not to be, you know, like um, so interested that it becomes overwhelming. Um, I can guarantee everyone on this um, webinar today and everyone who will watch in the future knows someone, loves someone who is a sex worker. And if you don't know that they're a sex worker, it's because they have determined that you are not a safe place to share that information. And it's gonna make it really difficult for you to provide um, respectful and dignified um, assistance with them. So we just wanna encourage people to treat the people that you're serving, treat the people that you're serving the way that you would wanna be treated if you were in a similar situation. Um, you know, Be compassionate and understanding and help them create their own case plan. Um, one of the projects that um, SWAP has been trying to launch this year has been um, a self-directed case management system. Um, and it sounds really awesome. And I, when I, I, I really think that this is going to be amazing if we ever get it to work like it's supposed to. Um, it takes practice. Yes, it repetition, does. Repetition, repetition, repetition. Yes. You have to keep doing it. It's new. And what we do is we, we, we have a basically a menu of services. People can fill out their own um, case man request for case management, and very often we are able to meet those short term needs, and we are able to connect them with other organizations who provide different kinds of things. Um, and it's it's really it's really been very helpful because people are able to say, oh, yeah, I want to get my own apartment, but I don't have identification. So that's some place where we can step in and we can say, let's help you get your identification. Um, you know, I, I've been involved in doing work with people who are coming out of jail since um, 2008, and it never fails, but I'll pick up somebody at the bus stop when they've been released from prison or, you know, at, at, the, jo at the jail after they've gotten bonded out, I'll pick them up and they'll sit down and we'll talk for a little bit, we'll go through a drive through and it doesn't take very long before there they are sitting to me in their prison slides and you know, the outfit that they were arrested and they treat me and I say, gosh, I want to do what you do. And I'm like, well, let's get your ID first. You know, so um, 
I really believe that the empowerment model, um, when we're talking to people who have been involved in sex trade, whether it be victims, survivors, um, sex workers, people who are 100% consensual, 100% victimized, whatever, that we treat them with dignity and respect and that we empower them to take charge of their own lives and make their own changes at their own pace. Um, everybody has different challenges. We need, we have services that people need to have. They need to have health care. They need to have um, access to housing. They need to feel like their lives are stabilized a little bit. And um, we can't keep asking broken communities to fix the broken community. So um, that's where, you know, we hope that, that this will be very helpful. Um, yes, the swap line does absolutely take volunteers. Um, we do not have a rigorous training program, but we do have a, an awesome um, admin who has the answer to almost everything when it comes to um, uh, the community support line calls. So um, any of our volunteers who sign on and decide that they want to take a shift on either the chat for support line or if they want to um, uh or if they want to um, take part in answering the actual physical line, um, definitely hit us up. There's a volunteer form on our website. You can fill it out. We'll send you the information and we'll talk about it. Um, I'm a law clerk. Oh gosh, yes, darling, we hear you. Um, one of the things that we want to do in 2022 <laughs> um, is we want to be able to provide um, education and information to people who are within the criminal justice system. Um, we can keep screaming to the void and um, not having anyone pay attention, or we can we can get inside the criminal justice system and work from within. So as a law clerk or a judge's clerk or a public defender or a state attorney's um, a social worker within the public defender's office, um, as a clerk who is working at the clerk of court even, it would be helpful for people to know how to do um, how to talk to people and where to refer them and what organizations do do what? Yes, organizations start conversations, and that's what makes change possible. Um, the more we communicate, the more we the more we are. Charleston <laughs> Pro Bono Legal Services. Charleston, yes, um, absolutely. Uh, we love our we love our folks up there. Um, we have we have a lot of people in. Alex is in Florida. Carolina. I'm in Pennsylvania. So wait, Charleston, South Carolina. Yeah. That yeah, South Carolina. Okay. Yep. Um, okay, yes, decrim. Did that answer your question about concrete steps? Me saying that there weren't any concrete steps? Was that helpful? <clears throat> They're squishy. All right. Well, thank you guys very much for your time today. We really appreciate it. My name is Alex. My email address is alex at swap behind bars. You can follow me um, on Twitter on my civilian account, which doesn't usually post a lot of sex work stuff. You'll just see a lot of stuff about golden retrievers, but occasionally um, something happens there. And that's at sane survivor. Um, I am a survivor of, um, of exploitation. I'm a survivor of de domestic violence. Um, I have been um, a sex worker since 1984 and I have been involved in advocacy since 2008. Um, I've been incarcerated, um, I've been um, assaulted, I've been held at gunpoint. Um, there's, there's a lot of stuff that I've been through and it's only been through the good folks who work for social service organizations and lots and lots and lots of therapy that I'm able to continue doing um, all, of these, all of this work. In addition to DCRIM, what policy initiatives would be the most beneficial to sex worker communities? This is a great question. Um, one of the things would be if we could all report violence without fear of arrest. Absolutely. Um, if the cops would have stop having sex with the people with the people that they were targeting for arrest during their sting operations, that would be extremely helpful. I think not backing up and explaining that it is not illegal for law enforcement to sexually interact with in, uh, sex traff potential sex trafficking victims or people in the sex industry during investigations. It's something that's only become a discussion over the last few years, uh, especially in Alaska, California, Hawaii. Uh, Pennsylvania has been involved in that discussion, but uh, that is something that is, is still kind of a, a gray area right now, so yeah. Um, and another thing that is extremely helpful is not using misdemeanor 
um, petty kind of things in order to arrest sex workers. Um, things like loitering for the purposes of prostitution or you have too many condoms. Grown ass women should be able to carry around as many condoms as they want. Um, we feel like that's, that's a really uh, um, important thing. So those are things that are small bites into the big apple of, of decriminalization. Um, in addition to decrim, and then how about looking into developing a self-directed mindfulness program, which touches up, touches on setting up and putting into practice a meditation approach to aiding those who are in or mediation. about to your incarceration. Yeah. One of, did you say, is it, no, it's meditation okay. or mediation? Rachel? Meditation? I think meditation, yeah. Yeah, you know, here's... I, I absolutely support the idea of meditation, positive, um, positive uh, interactions, positive, um, positive, positive affirmations. Um, yeah, meditation is definitely a part of yeah. quality of life, but it, it's it's not part of um, prevention or or um, the getting services to people. It's not it's not an essential service. It's a quality of life elective. Yes. You know, that, that's very true, but I'm not sure that it should be. You know, um, it seems like um, mindfulness um, and, and and talking about meditation, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, all of the the young women that I have dealt with when, when they're coming out of prison, the idea of stopping for 10 minutes and just meditating is horrifying to them. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they feel like they've got to be doing something all the time and it's usually something harmful. Um, so, you know, those are the, those are the things that we want to, we would like to put into practice. Um, SWAP does have a weekly, um, uh, uh, sex worker positive, um, therapy, um, on Wednesdays, uh, at six o'clock in the evening. Um, that's central standard time. Well, I will say the person who asked that question, he and I have a daily meditation at 5 a.m. every morning and have been doing so with a small grouping of people for approximately six months. That is something that I have offered to have uh, anybody interested in uh, access. So far, we have not had a, a strong response from the sex work community or the survivor community. One, uh, it, it is purposely very early in the morning. It's an intentional effort to get up and, and be present as able, but it is a free offering. And if anybody would like information about that, they are absolutely welcome to email. I would love to be a part of that. Um, I am usually meditating with a cup of coffee at 5 a.m. As long but as you're sitting <laughs> still while you drink it. <laughs> okay, all right, I'll accept that. Okay. So another question is, while incarcerated, what group programs were helpful to you during your time? What aspects of these group programs were helpful? Trauma-informed care, safety intervention, housing opportunities upon release, um, et cetera. The things that were the most helpful to me were, um, were letter writing, um, having someone to communicate with, having a lot of books to read. Um, I, I didn't really get into self-help books, believe it or not, until I went to jail the first time. And that is where I discovered what is still to this day, um, one of my most favorite, um, one of my most favorite self-help books. Um, and that, that is one of the things that I've really, um, I, I really think is important. Um, because of my experience, um, Swap Behind Bars started a um, an Amazon wish, wish list for our incarcerated members. Um, we also provide free GEDs to prisons who um, may have the ability to test people once they've done, but they don't have the funding to provide them with the tutoring. Um, uh, the reading of books, reading is so incredibly important. And I, I do think that it has a lot of, um, a lot of value to the self, um, even if it's just a novel. Um, it is something that you're doing for recreation. It's something that you're doing to kind of settle yourself and um, it kind of gets you visual and inside the story. Um, so those, th those are things that are very helpful. Um, the, the, this group's programs, you know, they didn't talk about trauma informed, wasn't a thing when I was in jail. Um, safety intervention, um, you know, the only housing opportunities were, um, were halfway houses or shelters, um, which things really haven't changed that much since then. Um, but it, the trauma informed 
is very helpful if you're not just saying the words trauma informed. Yeah, the repetition of trauma informed over and over can be as traumatic as the the experience of, but the actual programs are are usually excellent if they can be executed. Yes, execution is everything. Execution is everything. So, um, if you're going to be trauma informed, it can't just be a um, you know something that you put on your website. Um, you actually have to practice the idea of trauma informed. Um, this is an issue that we're running into a lot with the harm reduction um, groups, uh, syringe exchanges that are that are now becoming legal. They want to do all this data collection. Um, I had a um, a group approach me from Tampa, and they're all ready to go give out you know thousands and thousands and thousands of syringes on street outreach, but they want them to answer this 50 question survey. Um, so that they can get registered for the program. And that's just not helpful. You know, it's just not helpful at all. That's your choice. Um, uh, answering a 50 question survey um, is not, is just not helpful. Uh, there are programs in support of incarcerated people called Prison Project. Yes, those are wonderful. Yes, and we do send a lot of books about yoga, a lot of magazines. Um, we have several um, prisoners who have taken to doing their own yoga um, and meditation um, workshops actually in the prison. Now, obviously a lot of these shut down a lot, which um, during COVID, so people weren't doing them nearly as often, but um, you know that that is something that when we find someone who has a lot of interest in meditation and yoga or some sort of healing intervention, regardless of what it is, we try to support them by providing them with the resources and the support they need in order to do that. Right. I will note that in many situations, there is still a faith-based model in place and that it's not always welcome to go too deep into that. And I think that's something that should be discussed at, at a later time and not in this discussion, please. Caroline, that is such a great question. Um, uh, Melanie, while I'm talking about this subject, will you get the, um, the link to the, um, uh, the, Do the math, the pod podcast about, um, the girl who won the settlement with the police officer, you did the initial interview. Oh, with uh, Donna Sanford. Yes, Donna Sanford. I'm sorry, my brain is just not completely Absolutely. functional today. Um, yes, we have seen sex workers successfully report to police with their harassment or misconduct. Um, Donna Sanford is an excellent example, and Melanie is going to be putting the um, link to this podcast interview that, that we did with her in the chat. Um, I'm super um, glad to be able to talk about this because she was actually assaulted by a police officer who arrested her at the police station. And um, she was able to talk him down because she really felt like he was going to kill him. And because she didn't live there, she felt comfortable going to the FBI, making a report and suing the city for um, harassment. I believe that he was fired and I believe that he did go to prison. Um, I'm, I'm not... I'm not positive about that. Melanie will definitely have better information on that. Maybe. That is an un, that is an unusual case. Most of the time, sex workers are not believed when they report harassment or misconduct, or it's dismissed by higher ups. Um, I live in the Orlando area. Um, the Metropolitan Bureau of Investigation has repeatedly been um, very difficult with sex workers and exploit exploitative and um they are trying to get better but it's really hard when it's um when it's kind of ingrained in the culture of the organization um and and that particular vice squad has has just had a lot of real complications were you able to find that melanie i know i'm sorry yeah. to toss that at you so um yeah, I just didn't know if when I'm looking on the computer, if that is an intrusion into everybody's screen. So I'm going to do it this way. Hello, Mattress Express. Yes, I think probably the best, um, the best thing to do uh, when you hear that that sex workers are reporting um, to police, or if you hear about sex workers experience, experiencing violence, simply ask them how you can help and, and then listen to what they have to say. There it is. 
that this is a really awesome episode on our um, on our podcast. It's an all in a day sex work, um, and it's the episode number twenty nine. There's right. another right. excellent one, November. It's November eleventh, twenty twenty, from the it's season one space, November eleventh, twenty twenty. We also have a situation where a family whose daughter was uh, murdered by a vice officer was recently compensated about a million dollars. Uh, there had been a great delay in uh, getting any kind of investigation into their daughter's death. That would be Donna Castleberry Dalton. And she was shot in uh, numerous times in an unmarked car that was sealed against a, a wall um, where it was unclear if she even understood why she was in the company of an undercover officer who had not identified himself. Uh, there was a protest for a grand jury investigation into the situation. And finally then, yeah, the family was awarded a uh, million dollars. So I'll also put that up in a moment. It's, a, it's always wonderful to have these, um, these, you know, wins where people are getting awarded for, you know, but it's a grievous assault. Yeah, is that you know, really a grievous assault? assault? I'm sure that they would rather have their family member back. Yeah. I'm sure that they would rather have not been assaulted. I'm sure that, you know, all of all of those things can be true. Um, what what COVID has done is it has exposed the gaps in our systems. Um, it's let us know that there are a lot of things that um, that we, we're falling short on. And I think that COVID gave us an opportunity to determine how we can do better to serve our communities. The ones that include sex workers, the ones who include victims, and the ones who include survivors. And we, we need to all be in this together to make sure that people are getting the best quality care that they possibly can and that they feel like they do have a safe place. And if you feel like someone won't talk to you for whatever reason, you have someone that you can have them talk to. You know, you can have them call me. You can have them call Melanie. You can have them call our support, support line. There's just a lot of really, um, really great things that um, we can all do when we all work together. Um, and that's really my my big takeaway from almost everything is let's all work together to provide better services and support for people who are not in their best life at the time. It's a learning experience, so I'll say as I, I'm learning how to be able to work with the case support and case management if people have any kind of suggestions or resources they would like to pass on to me, I definitely am seeking to have enriched ability to serve the communities in need. Rachel, Rachel, is there anything that you'd like to add as far as PAVE's position with what we have been working on? Yeah, um, definitely. Well, first of all, I just want to thank you both for your time today. This was incredibly informative, and I think that the attendance and the comment section really reflects how much people want to know more about um, the Viminal space, and I, I completely agree with everything you've said. Um, I really appreciate you all speaking on um, the law enforcement side of things as well. Um, from a survivor perspective, I've dealt with a lot of survivors that have been assaulted by law enforcement and reporting is just such, it's such a barrier, I think, when the perpetrator is coming from law enforcement. Um, so thank you for kind of speaking on that issue as well. Um, and we obviously, you know, support sex workers and also survivors of human trafficking. So um, thank you for kind of explaining the difference between consensual sex work and then human trafficking um, or sex trafficking. And thank you just so much for being here today and for this incredible um, conversation. And thank you to all of our panel or our attendees um, for the questions that you've been asking and for being so engaging in the comment section. Um, this was just an incredible conversation. And, and thank you, Alex and Melanie for your work um, with SWOP Behind Bars. Um, I'm just, I'm excited to continue this partnership and this conversation. Thank you for having us. We're glad to be here. Awesome. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, if you know you have any questions that didn't get answered today or any that come up after the presentation, feel free to email um, me. My name is Rachel um, and at pavingtheway.net is my email. So Rachel at pavingtheway.net um, or Melanie and Alex, if y'all are open to emails, um, if you want to put my email in. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Oh, 
Oh, we need a we need a volunteer at Swipe Chicago. So that's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, forming forming new relationships that work to mm -hmm. empower the the you know public position on things is is very helpful because right now the the relationship between the communities has been very challenged and the more empathy that there is, I believe, the better that that will will go. Great work, Pave. Thank you. Great work to you both as well. <laughs> yeah, celebrating all. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you all so much for being here today um, and for your wonderful presentation and amazing voices and for your work. Um, please reach out if you have any additional questions from the attendees. Um, we will always be here for you. Um, and thank you again to Melanie and Alex. It was so lovely to have you here today. And um, Alex, to meet you because we haven't met face to face yet. Um, so just thank you again from the bottom of my heart. And um, I hope to talk to you both very soon. Thank you. Be welcome. Bye-bye. Bye.